Member for Vancouver, Point Grey. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise to discuss, discuss the budget today. And uh, I think that to start off, I'll just give a quick overview of what a budget's all about. Two questions that the government answers in the budget. The first is, where do you want to spend your money? And the second question is, where are you going to get that money from? In this budget, uh, the government has answered those questions. Where do they want to spend the money? And where are they going to get the money from? And the answer to the question of where they're going to get the money from has been answered in a way that I find uh, incredibly surprising. This government would rather increase the fees of British Columbians, MSP, ICBC, BC Hydro, tuition, you name it, than maintain uh, income tax on the top 2% of earners in the province. And the cost of this, uh, of this cut that they've given to the top 2% is over $230 million. That's money that's going to have to be recovered from somewhere, honorable speaker, and the budget answers the question where that's going to be recovered from. You heard uh, my colleague, uh, uh, the uh, spokesperson on, uh, on finance for the opposition, rise and, and go through in great detail the fees that are going to be levied on British Columbians in order to make this up. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I had an exchange on Twitter uh, with, uh, with one of the members of uh, the government, the Minister of the Environment, uh, just recently that I think illustrates for me uh, the trouble that this government has in understanding where to get the money from without hurting ordinary British Columbians. The question that we were discussing was, how can it be that one company can take a million liters of BC water for $2.25, put it in bottles, and sell it uh, for two bucks for 250 milliliters, what the, the effect of the policy in BC is, if you're the president of Nestle, you're writing a check to the government of British Columbia for less than 10 bucks, and you're selling 16 million 250 milliliter bottled, uh, bottles of water. And the exchange that I had on Twitter, Honorable Speaker, was shouldn't we be asking for a little bit more money from this company when they write a check for less than 10 bucks and they sell 16 million bottles of water. <laughs> Shouldn't, couldn't we get some revenue from this? And the Minister of the Environment wrote back and said, well, I can't figure out how to do that. Could, I mean, does that mean we start charging farmers for water? No, it doesn't mean that. Does, it, does that mean we start uh, charging uh, the forest industry and other industries in British Columbia for, for water rights? No, we're talking about a company that's taking water out of the ground, putting it in a bottle, selling it for two bucks, and we're charging them less than $3 for a million liters of water. And if this government can't figure out how to get more revenue from Nestle in that situation and other companies in the same situation, then no wonder this is such an anemic budget that hurts British Columbians because all they know how to do is raise fees for everyday British Columbians. And if they can't figure out how to get revenue from an obvious source like that, Honorable Speaker, then uh, I look forward to the rest of the year and the revelations that will come from this budget and the details in the estimates period as we go through that. Now, on, Honourable Speaker, the <laughs> Minister of the Environment says, I want to sell water, that's what my, my policy is. This government is giving our water away. Right? <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the line here is clear, Honourable Speaker, where, where this government wants to get their revenue from and where they don't. Honourable Speaker, I have a number of uh, spokesperson roles for the official opposition, and I'm going to start by going through my various uh, spokesperson portfolios to discuss the impact of this budget, and then I'm going to take things back to my constituency. I'm going to start with the BC Lottery Corporation. Now, the BC Lottery Corporation is responsible for administering lotteries and casinos in the province. The government projects that they will be spending an extra $4.8 million uh, at BCLC in operating costs over the next year, a $4.8 million uh, to operate the lotteries and casinos. Now, Honourable Speaker, does that sound reasonable? 
There's a cost of living increase for BCLC. I, I guess so, Honorable Speaker, if there hadn't been an audit that this government did of BCLC just a few short weeks ago in which this government detailed on its own the failures of this government with respect to BCLC's control of money. And it's important for people to understand that when BCLC spends a dollar, that's one dollar less that goes to public services, that's one dollar less that goes to hospitals, that's one dollar less that goes to schools. BC Lottery Corporation had an early retirement program that cost municipalities and everybody in British Columbia an unexpected $25 million instead of saving money. They thought this was going to save money. Why did it cost an extra $25 million, Honourable Speaker? Because they literally offered 18 months severance to every senior executive in the corporation, regardless of length of service. Imagine this, Honourable Speaker. You're working at BCLC for two years. You're earning, let's say, a respectable $80,000 a year. And the provincial government comes to you and says, we'll give you $120,000 to walk out the door. You've only been here for two years. And guess what? There was a stampede for the door. But it wasn't, it wasn't amounts like that, Honourable Speaker. In fact, there was paid severance, despite giving working notice, to four employees of $300,000 each. They received $1.2 million total. Honourable Speaker, BCLC is supposed to. They have a role in making sure that retailers sell lottery tickets responsibly. They did one test of retailers. They found that 40% of retailers were selling lottery tickets to minors. They've got a fight going on with the, they've got a fight going on with the enforcement agency called GPEB that goes in and does enforcement in casinos that's leading to a delay in criminal investigations. They've seen a major increase in the number of suspicious cash transactions at casinos and they cut the $1 million budget of the RCMP team that was the dedicated casino investigation team. So, Honourable Speaker, we see an almost $5 million increase for BC Lottery Corporation, but this is the same corporation that cut the budget for the RCMP team that was dedicated to policing crime in casinos. And, Honourable Speaker, I've toured a number of casinos now in our province. I've met the operators. They would be glad to cooperate and work with a dedicated RCMP team to support their internal security teams. And yet, for some reason, this government cut that team. And what was the impact of that cut that hasn't, Honourable Speaker, been restored in this budget? The impact of that cut was major increases in suspicious cash transactions at BC casinos. Review after review finds that casinos are reporting suspicious cash transactions and nobody's investigating them, Honourable Speaker. The Minister of Finance puzzled, quote, what I am detecting, this was in 2014, what I am detecting is a degree of frustration on the part of some officials who collect that information, forward it on, and lose track of what becomes of it. Honourable Speaker, how in this budget can there be an extra $5 million for the BC Lottery Corporation that wastes money like this and cuts the $1 million budget of the RCMP enforcement team? How can that be the case? Honourable Speaker, I'm also responsible for the BC Pavilion Corporation. The BC Pavilion Corporation, it's an unusual name, maybe people don't know what they do. They're responsible for BC Place and the Convention Center in Vancouver, the corporation that's a, that administers these. Uh, people across BC may remember that this government spent almost a billion dollars on the new Convention Center. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars putting a new roof on BC Place when we have schools that haven't been seismically upgraded in this province. And they did these things, Honourable Speaker, because they said that they could bring in extra revenue. They would bring in revenue for the province. BC Lottery Corp, or, pardon me, Pavco projects that their revenue is going to drop by $6.4 million in the coming year. Got a new roof, got a new convention center, revenue is dropping. And at Pavco, just like at the BC Lottery Corporation, expenses rising by $5 million. Now, this government tells school boards, find the money. We're not going to fund you an extra cent, find the money. And yet, 
when, they, when Pavco shows up, they got the billion dollar convention center, they got the roof, cost hundreds of million dollars, went way over budget. And they say, oh, here's an extra five million dollars. Spend it wisely. Honorable Speaker, $125 million in opera operating expenses for the BC Pavilion Corporation. And I'm afraid to say, Honorable Speaker, to this House that the expenses are just beginning for the BC Pavilion Corporation because they have partnered with an unbelievable company to, to build the Site 10A mega casino in downtown Vancouver. Of all of the casino developers in the world, the BC Pavilion Corporation chose a company called Paragon. And it wasn't just anybody. And Honorable Speaker, I've been invited to say that in the hall, and I have said it in the hall. Not only that, I said it in the papers, and I'll say it again in the papers because their track record is defended by something that, as a lawyer, I know is truth. And let me lay down a little bit of truth on the mining minister here, Honorable Speaker. The company that the Attorney General and the Minister of Education on the board of Pavco chose has two Canadian casino developments in this country that have been completed. They're both in Alberta. One of them went bankrupt, Honorable Speaker. Yes, that's right. Paragon bankrupted one of their two Canadian casinos prior to building out Site 10A. The second casino, Honorable Speaker, Alberta's regulator cut off their access to Aboriginal development grants after it found that they were being misused. They then defaulted on a line of credit to CIBC, and now they're no longer involved in that project either. So 0 for 2, Honourable Speaker, on their projects in Canada, and yet BC chose this company to develop Site 10A. Honourable Speaker, I hear the Mines Minister is much quieter now. I wish he'd spoken up, Honourable Speaker, at the time that the, at, at the, time the Attorney General and the Minister of Education chose this company when they sat on the PAVCO board. I wish he'd been there to say, have you done the due diligence? Did you call Alberta, where they're operating two casinos, where they've cut off the access to the grants, where they've done repeated audits of this company and found problems. That he wasn't there, I wish he'd been there. Honorable Speaker, Paragon's partner, their First Nations partner, on one of those two projects, had to go to the Alberta government and ask for an extra $2.1 million for legal expenses arising from that project. So when I say that the expenses for PAVCO are just beginning, I speak with some experience in knowing what Paragon's situation was in Alberta. I'm sorry to say. Honourable Speaker, we see the budget for, uh, for tourism in this, uh, in this province. You know, there was, uh, there was a really interesting discussion in Vancouver about why there wasn't a New Year's Eve festival in Vancouver this year. Why would, so, so many other cities have big New Year's Eve celebrations, and unfortunately there just wasn't the money this year in Vancouver to have a New Year's Eve celebration. Now, why is that, Honourable Speaker? Well, there's an organization called Tourism Vancouver important organization promoting tourism in Vancouver. They take a portion. If you stay in a hotel room in Vancouver, they take a portion of your hotel room uh, cost. It's a hotel room tax. Funds this organization. Now, this government decided, Honourable Speaker, that Tourism Vancouver should help them pay for the convention centre that went so far over budget, cost almost a billion dollars. And the impact of that, Honourable Speaker, Tourism Vancouver's total debt has increased from $97,000 five years ago to $101 million, $106 million, $109 million, $119 million at a small tourism promoter because they are helping pay for this over budget convention center. The amount of hotel tax that they dedicated to, to debt payment in the last year, $3.7 million more than enough for a blowout New Year's Eve celebration, but instead, they're paying for this government's convention centre. You know, it's, it's remarkable how well our tourism operators are doing, despite this government's best efforts. You know, I went up to the Caribou Chilcotin where they cancelled the Discovery Route ferry and where they faced the disaster at Mount Pauly, trying to recover up there. And they're resilient, man. They're working hard up there. They're driving the tourism numbers despite everything this government does to them. And I'm, I, I was inspired, frankly, to go up there and see those British Columbians working so hard to keep their businesses going in the face of, uh, of what they're doing. You know, there used to be, uh, for the, for, I see Honourable Speaker, we have some guests here for background. There used to be uh, a ferry, a wonderful ferry that people could book. 
they travel around uh, the discovery route. Uh, they would stay in, uh, there were little rooms in them. It was a, a beautiful trip and it was sold to Europeans overseas. It was sold to Germans and they were very excited to come to the Caribou tour around. This government canceled the ferry and they canceled it in the middle of the season so that a bunch of people had put deposits on trips uh, were caught out. A bunch of businesses were totally caught out and they replaced it with a ferry with hardly uh, any amenities uh, and certainly uh, one that does not compare and as a result we've lost a huge number of bookings, a number of people are looking at losing their businesses. These are the kinds of decisions that are hidden between the lines in these budgets. When you look at tourism you don't see cancellation of the Discovery Route ferry but, but it's there, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, I'm also responsible for housing and I spent a number of years working in the downtown east side of Vancouver on the housing issue I'm, I'm, uh, and, and in that role I travelled uh, all over the province talking to other housing advocates. I try to imagine this, Honourable Speaker, that in the same year this government gave $220 million, $230 million to the richest 2% of British Columbians, they cut the housing capital fund by 62%. The budget for the cap housing capital fund, this is to build housing for homeless people. The budget for this fund was $39 million in 2014-15 and only $15 million in 2015-16. Now, Honourable Speaker, I come from, I'm fortunate to come from a very affluent constituency. I think it's the second most affluent following the uh, new uh, Minister of Advanced Education's uh, constituency in Colchena. There are a lot of people who earn more than $150,000 in my constituency. I can tell you right now, Honourable Speaker, the vast majority of those people would tell you, if you took that tax increase and you applied it to the homeless problem in BC, I would be happy. I wish you would do that. They would tell that to this government. But instead, this government gave them a tax cut they didn't ask for, and to pay for it, they're cutting the capital fund that builds housing for the homeless in this province. Can you imagine that? I'm not making up that this is what this fund is for. This is the quote from the service plan. This grant, this grant that's been cut, this grant for housing capital funding is meant to supply housing for those at risk of homelessness and to fund infrastructure projects to increase the supply of provincially owned housing for seniors and persons with disabilities. Cut at 62%. And honorable speaker, it's not just this cut because the provincial government is currently selling the BC housing stock. This is, the, this is the policy that they are selling it. Some of it's great, selling it to the nonprofits that operate it, give them a chance to build up some, some uh, capital, do some renovations, expand. But where's the money, Honourable Speaker? Where's the money in the budget that they're taking in from these sales? Somewhere in miscellaneous revenue. Where is it going? We're told it's going back into housing, and yet the housing capital fund has been cut by 62%. You're selling the BC housing properties, and the housing minister promised in the media over and over, the head of BC housing has promised over and over, this money's going back into housing. Where is it? I can't see it. Honorable, question, Honorable uh, Speaker, I'll be canvassing this in estimates, but I can assure you there are a lot of people who will be looking for this money because they believed that this government would not be taking the sale of housing for the homeless, taking the money from that and using it to give a tax cut to the richest 2% of British Columbians. Nobody believed that that was the case. It can't be the case. Surely it can't be the case. Member, <laughs> the member for Kingsway says he thinks it may be the case. I, I try to conceive of a world in which you sell housing dedicated for the homeless and use it to pay for a tax cut for the top 2%. I hope that we're not there yet. <laughs> Honourable Speaker, the residential tenancy branch. You go talk to landlords. You go talk to tenants and you ask them, have you been to the residential tenancy branch lately and you will get an earful. It takes months to get a hearing. Landlords can't get rid of problem tenants. Tenants can't deal with problem landlords. It's not working for anybody. There are landlords in this province where the roof literally fell in. 
on people in this province because they didn't do necessary maintenance. And yet, the residential tenancy branch doesn't have enough staff to go do the investigations and lay the administrative penalties that are set out in the Act. They simply can't do it. They're overwhelmed with the number of hearings they have to do. And here we see that the residential tenancy branch to address these issues has received an extra $39,000. $39,000? The residential tenancy branch has to pay increased hydro costs, increased MSP, just like every other employer in the province. This $39,000 isn't, isn't even going to cover it. So not only will, will residential tenancy service be, it's not going to be the same as the, as the substandard service that landlords and tenants are complaining about, it's actually going to be worse. Now, Honourable Speaker, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an obscure promise, but I remember it, and anyone who's had a problem with their strata will remember this, but the Minister for Housing promised that he would establish a tribunal in this province so that people who have problems with their strata council don't have to go to court anymore to deal with it. He promised to establish a tribunal where you could bring your complaint forward, just like the residential tenancy branch, about your strata, and it would be dealt with outside of court. It's going to save money because we don't have to pay a judge to hear it. It's going to be faster because the rules of evidence are less and it's easier to deal with. And it's going to be more accessible to people. And, and I hope nobody, uh, Honourable Speaker, in this House has ever had the situation of having a problem with your strata council. But if you have, then you will know how difficult it is when the house that you live in, you can't find a remedy except to go to BC Supreme Court. This is something that needs to happen, and yet there's no money in the budget to deal with it. Maybe it'll happen next year. Well, we'll have to see. But maybe this is one more promise that's expendable, unlike the promise to make the biggest uh, uh, expense in this budget the cut to the wealthiest 2% of British Columbians. That, that promise wasn't expendable. Honourable Speaker, I tried to make sense of the, the budget projections for revenue for liquor. I have to say, Honourable Speaker, these numbers, they can't be based in any kind of reality. Because it was just a week and a half ago that the Attorney General cut what's called the wholesale price for premium wines in British Columbia. This is the top, most expensive wines. The, the Attorney General issued a press release. The, the increase that she's been planning on doing for months, she's abandoned it. So that, that's not uh, imaginary money. That was real revenue that this government was counting on. And it was revenue the government was counting on to ensure that the wholesale price reform was revenue neutral. That was, they bring in the same amount of money when they changed around the system. Now, if you make a big cut to the amount of money you're expecting to take from the most expensive wines, and your math had been based on keeping everything the same, obviously you're looking at a loss of revenue there. It's just it's really straightforward. And yet, the projected revenues for, for liquor in the province remain the same. Now, how can that be, Honorable Speaker? How could that be revenue neutral? I look forward to seeing the, uh, seeing the results on the, uh, on the fiscal year, to see how that's possible. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain the Attorney General is not a magician because she'd have to pull some cash out of a hat to make that work. Honorable Speaker, I'd like to, to transition into uh, a discussion of the opportunity cost, at least as far as my con constituents are concerned, of the $220 million tax cut for the richest 2% of the province. I uh, stood shoulder to shoulder with a number of young people in our constituency trying to save the only dedicated youth clinic in Metro Vancouver that's the Pine Tree Clinic. This is a clinic that was open for 40 years, supported by all different stripes of government, where young people could go and get the medical treatment they need. No judgment, just young people and doctors and nurses who are expert in dealing with young people. And this government closed that clinic. Honorable Speaker, their budget was a fraction of the $220 million that this government gave it to the wealthiest 2% of, of, uh, of this province. Honorable Speaker, I've got a, a dedicated group of parents. They're, they're, uh, they're a real uh, champion group who send their kids to Bayview Elementary. And they know, as this government knows, that Bayview Elementary is not seismically upgraded. 
If there is an, an earthquake, uh, that school will be flat. It's a very old school, a beautiful school, a heritage school. But they know that they're sending their kids to a school that's not safe. And honorable speaker, $220 million cut for the wealthiest 2% in this province, and Bayview Elementary is still not seismically upgraded. How can that be? Honorable Speaker, education funding, a lot of people in my constituency, English is not their first language, and yet new policy in this province, free English as a second language training, doesn't exist anymore. Adult basic education, you better start to pay for that as well. Honorable Speaker, if I had a, a nickel for every, uh, for every person who came into my office with concerns about their kid who has a learning disability that needs extra support, maybe their kid's gifted, Maybe their kid uh, participates in a music program that they really enjoy. They want funding for those programs. Well, I guess I'd be able to, uh, to fund a good chunk of this tax cut for the, for the wealthiest 2% of British Columbians. There are students who are going to schools who need to be assessed for their learning disabilities, but the school boards aren't assessing them because there's no point. The services don't exist for them if they're assessed to have a learning disability the services don't exist to address that learning disability. And yet this government cut $220 million for the wealthiest 2%. UBC, part of my constituency, the students there are facing a 20% increase in rent. You're staying in, uh, staying in, a, in a dorm room at UBC, you're going to face a 20% rent increase. They're already facing tuition increases. And it was already the case in this province that student loans don't cover the full cost of education. Can you imagine paying 20% more rent for housing that doesn't even have any basic tenancy protections because UBC has been entirely exempted from the residential tenancy branch? You know, this, imagine, too, that this is the group that thought they'd come to this government and say, hey, you know what would be really great is a graduate scholarship for British Columbia. You know, a lot of provinces give uh, a little bit of cash to graduate students to help offset the costs of their education. Wouldn't it be great if British Columbia did that? Instead, what are they seeing? A 20% increase in rent and tuition increases. They got completely the opposite of what they asked for. Not, not the, this government didn't make it easier. I mean, it's significantly harder for them to get an education. $220 million will go a long way here, Honorable Speaker. Many of my constituents come to my office, they've got a kid with an addiction problem, they've got a partner who's depressed, who's got anxiety, they need mental health services. There's a homeless person who's had to make a house out behind their store. They don't want to call the police because it doesn't seem right. They've got a, clearly got a mental health issue that needs help. $220 million would go a long way here, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I want to talk about another issue, and that's what happens if we get to uh, close to the fiscal year end and this government hasn't quite balanced the budget. Well, we see a repeat of what happened in fiscal 2013. Now, that's where the, this government sold $601 million in property in a single year. The previous year, they sold $11 million. Fiscal 2013, they sold $601 million in property in a single year. The amount of the budget surplus, $384 million. Well, thank goodness we had a lot of things to sell. Well, there's a big piece of property, provincial property in my constituency, Honorable Speaker, called the Jericho Lands. And you know, I don't have a lot of nice things to say about this federal government, I'll be honest with you. But the federal government, the Canada Lands Corporation, has come in, they're consulting with the community, they're taking a period of years to look at this sale and redevelopment and do it properly with the community. I do not want to see this government come in and sell that property to make their budget surplus overnight to one of their friends. And that's the history we've seen, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, in this budget that's been presented, we've seen massive increases year over year in ICBC, MSP, Hydro, and a cut for the people, many of whom live in my constituency, who would have told this government, if you've got a good purpose for it, and you can show me that money's going to that purpose, then do it. But instead, they got a tax cut they didn't even ask for. Honorable Speaker, I can tell you that if this government came with a plan for that money that made sense to deal with homelessness or mental health or education, any priority, they would see huge support in my constituency. 
So why are they doing this, honorable speaker? Why are they taking this tact? I have no idea. But I hope they'll reconsider. Thank you, honorable speaker. Thank the member to recognize the member for Burnaby North. 